Okay, cool. Just as an FYI, the meeting's now started, uh, the meeting recording has now started. Um, so we'll move on to our uh, Faculty of Science representative. Hi, my name is Wei Chun. I will pronounce he, him, his. My access is our map. Thanks so much, Wei Chun. We'll move to our Health Sciences route. Hi everyone, I'm Nafoni. My pronouns are she, her, hers. For access needs, I may have to leave a little bit early and I'm gonna turn off my camera so I can finish eating as well. Thank you, Nafoni. Um, uh, our education representative. Hi, my name is Emerly. She, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Thanks, Emerly. Um, our environment rep. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anuki, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and for access needs, I'm just going to keep my camera off because I'm also eating. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no worries. Um, okay, we'll go to society staff and loop around to our um, our guests. So um, we have a campaigns research and policy coordinator. Sir, is your um, is your mic still acting up a bit? Okay, that's no worries. All right. Um, if you could just type your um, your name, pronouns, and access needs in the chat, and um, we can now continue down the list. Then, um, our executive director is not coming. Um. Executive assistant, I don't see her on the call yet. So, and I didn't hear from her that she wasn't coming. So maybe she's yet to join the call. So we'll move on then. Administrative assistant. Hi everyone, I'm Kristin and she, her, hers and all my access needs are met. Thanks so much, Kristin. Um, and we'll loop back to um, our guests. So we have Poom, our at-large representative. Hello, my name is Poom. I am an at-large representative. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and all my excellent news are met. Thanks, Poom. And we also have Jasmine here attending the meeting as well. Hello, my name is Jasmine. Uh, pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Thanks so much, Jasmine. And so I don't think I've missed anyone. Let me double check. No, all right, good. So we'll move on to item number four then, which is the adoption of the agenda. So be it resolved to adopt the agenda as presented. Is someone able to move that motion? Samad moves, is there a seconder? Is there a seconder? Uh, I can second Anuki. Anuki seconds, thanks so much. Um, are there any amendments to the agenda that would like to be made? Uh, Nafoni? Hi, so I would like to amend the agenda to include this motion. I'll just paste it into the chat box, but it's be it resolved that the UAA committee establish a working group on anti-Black racism, be it further resolved to appoint Jasmine Peachy as members of this working group with Nafoni Modi and Anuki Karuna Jiwa as working group leads. All right, thank you, Nafoni. So that will go, can go under, um, we can create a section, new business, right under updates, between updates and discussion items to in, and include that motion within that section. Um, are there any other, um, I'd actually, I'd like to add a discussion item um, that would be titled asynchronous learning. So that will be 7.3, well, I guess 8.3 at this point, but that'll be titled asynchronous learning. Um, is there any other, Amendments to the agenda. All right, seeing none. Um, I'll ask. Does anyone want to move all those amendments? I'll move. Nafoni. Nafoni moves. All right. Cool. Is there a seconder? Uh, I can second. Sama. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay, don't worry, some mud seconds. Um, is there uh, any discussion on the amendments? If not, we'll move to a vote then. All those in favor, seeking unanimous consent. And again, if you uh, want to oppose or 
dissent, please just unmute your mic and I'm seeing no opposition. So that motion will carry unanimously. So we'll move back to the main motion then. So be it resolved to adopt the agenda as amended. And if there's no other discussion on the amendment or on the, on the main motion, pardon me, uh, we'll move to a vote then. So seeking unanimous consent on the motion, all those in favor. All right, so seeing no opposition, that motion will also carry unanimously. Thanks everyone. We we'll move on to matters arising from the minutes then. Uh, 5.1, be it resolved to receive and file the following main meeting minutes from the UAA committee um, on June the 16th. Is there a mover for that motion? Emerly moves. Emerly moves. Is there a seconder? No second. Wait in seconds. Thanks so much. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Everyone had a chance to look at them and they all look good. Okay, sounds good. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to fix something on my computer. What is happening? Okay, sorry about that, something funky happened. Anyway, uh, so I guess I was seeking unanimous consent on the motion then, um, seeing no more discussion, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, and I'm seeing no opposition on the motion, so that will carry unanimously as well. Amazing. So we have our some of our housekeeping items out of the way. <clears throat> we'll move to our updates, uh, update section. And our first one is 6.1, joint operations group. So I will take this one on because Asib was unable to join the meeting today. So uh, some of the major themes that uh, occurred to the joint operations group, and uh, again, just uh, to reiterate, because I think it's important to reiterate this, the joint operations group is a, uh, is a committee uh, composed of representatives of SS, uh, the Graduate Student Society and uh, administrators of SFU. Asib and I represent the SFSS on that committee. Uh, Matt, the Director of External Relations, and um, uh, another GSS representative represent the GSS. Um, and then uh, other individuals such as John Driver, um, Wade Parkhouse, and uh, Ramana Khan uh, represent the SFU administration. And so at, at the last meeting, we had uh, a lot of thorough discussion on many topics, the first of which was uh, around the student affordability project. And this has been a project that's been in the works for a while, uh, kind of um, uh, started or was really worked on by my predecessor. And this is really to, um, it, it's a plan to work with the university to make students' lives more or university experience more affordable. And one of the ways that this is going to be kind of explored in the future is a new working group is actually being established um, within uh, the joint operations group that will uh, report to, to JOG. And uh, this uh, working group will consist of equal representation of uh, students. So I, I'm assuming Asib and I will both be on that committee as well, or that working group, pardon me, as well as um, uh, other representatives from the university to be, to be decided shortly, I believe. And so when determining projects that have priority on this working group, um, some things will be considered in terms of, you know, the financial sustainability of the university, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, reconciliation with indigenous peoples and the needs of international students, um, it, potential impacts on, you know, student finances, um, creating a mix of short-term and long-term projects. Um, and, just, uh, you know, the potential impact on the quality of education and student experience. And there'll be an annual review of this plan and, you know, checking in on overall progress every year. And um, some potential projects um, include, you know, direct costs, looking at direct costs, such as, you know, the cost of tuition, the cost of textbooks, and that really loops into our um, push for open educational resources, something that's important now is where, um, uh, you know, operating online, uh, doing online learning, um, other things such as housing and food, direct costs like that, but also indirect costs such as commuting, 
um, uh, study space, um, inability to get into the desired or required courses that might delay graduation and have further financially burdened students. Um, as well as just overall financial assistance, providing students with more financial, students in need um, with more financial assistance. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to the work that will happen soon on the student affordability project. And there's a, a lot of promise there, I think, for a lot of big um, issues around uh, affordability for students that can be addressed at the, in that working group. So it's going to be very exciting. Uh, the second big item that was kind of discussed at, at that meeting was discussion around uh, anti-Black racism on campus. And I think the one, well, two main things that came out of that discussion was A, stopping, um, uh, bring an end to RCMP recruitment on campus, uh, because it's, it's, it's a thing where students, uh, especially, you know, our Black students or our marginalized students, Indigenous students aren't feeling comfortable with RCMP officers being on campus. It brings a lot of um, negativity and um, negative, uh, you know, emotions and trauma, especially right now in such uh, a heightened climate where racism is really at the, at the forefront of a lot of a lot of news cycles and a lot of uh, you know at the forefront of people's lives right now so we're really working hard to make sure that uh, police recruitment no longer happens on our campuses just for the the safety of our students it's something that absolutely does not need to be happening on our campuses anymore um and the second thing that came out of that discussion was uh regarding the uh sfu uh the scottish clan team name um and we're we were asking in particular what is happening right now in terms of making sure that that, um, that gets changed. Um, and, you know, this has been a topic of discussion for many years and thus far, there's been not much real progress in terms of actually trying to initiate any real change. I think that that's beginning to change. Um, and currently, you know, it, as part of this discussion, the university mentioned its intention to start uh, uh, type of consultation progress um, regarding the name change. However, the, what that consultation will look like is still very unclear. Um, I, I believe they expressed a desire to host a town hall of sorts um, alongside or uh, with athletes, um, alumni, um, and hopefully with actually, uh, you know, black students on campus to hear what, what they have to say. Um, we've asked for a rough timeline on when these consultations will occur, um, but that um, again is still very unclear. Um, so to be aware that those, you know, those, those discussions around the SFU team name are still under discussion um, and we will continue to bring these concerns to jog and any other channel that's available to us because this is a very time sensitive and very pressing issue for a lot of our members right now and um we're getting a lot of um it, it's very it's a very big topic it, it was brought up at council um council passed a motion that um you know requested that the board um continue working on this issue because it's something that students are really um, sorry, I'm just looking at, Gabe is the working group within JOG. Yeah, Anuki, sorry. The student affordability uh, project is a working group within JOG. So it, it, yeah, it, it'll be passed at JOG, the establishment of that working group and it reports to the drone operations group. So yeah. Um, and I, I, the last kind of big discussion out of the JOG meeting, which I'll get to you in a minute, but the last um, discussion that came out was the uh, fall enrollment numbers. and. Uh, the main point there, I think, is that right now it's still er very early to project what enrollment numbers will look like for the fall semesters. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think right now there's a lot of uncertainty as to um, the amount of international students that will be coming to SFU. Um, and that there's a lot of reasons for that in terms of um, people trying to figure out their, their study visas and other things like that, but also from domestic students as well, because, um, you know, particularly our um, incoming undergraduates because uh, I, I mean I honestly can't imagine a lot of incoming first year students are very thrilled to be doing classes online so I think there's a lot of hesitation around 
um, newly admitted undergrads as to, you know, are they actually going to take courses in the fall? So um, that will be a continuing discussion as well. And I think that um, as that information comes in, um, the SFSS will be made aware almost immediately because um, that's very important information for us. Um, so that is some of the major uh, discussion items that came out of the Joint Operations Group meeting, and I'll pass it, I'll open it up to questions if there are any, and Wei Chun's on the speaking list, so I'll, I'll give Wei Chun the floor. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, the, is the consultation with the clan name, like, consultation about if they should change it, or consultation on, like, what the name should be, the new name? That's a good question, and I, um, it's not one that I'm actually very, I, I don't really know the answer to that. They have right now kind of failed to make a distinction as to which one of those types of consultations they're looking into. Um, I know that all the information that we got is that there is going to be some type of consultation. We don't know what that actually will look like. Um, I think this is this is also a discussion I think that's even been discussed at the Board of Governors level, but I, I again, I'm not sure the specifics of it because that um, is just not information that's out there yet. So again, I what we're pushing for is, is well, there isn't any reason that the team name shouldn't be changed. Like, I think anyone at all, can any student can, you know, can see why this name is problematic and why it's dangerous and why it's just not appropriate for a university to have this team name. And so uh, I, I don't think that by any stretch, <laughs> I, I would certainly hope that they're not asking, should we change it? It's why we should change it. Yeah, I, I just hope that uh, if, you know, this does come up again with a consultation, just make sure that we like we as a student society are firm that okay this should this name should change and like this we there's no need to go through consultation on like whether we should change it the consultation should be okay what should our new um, team name be because uh, this has been brought up since 2017 and it's been going on for too long they had the time to do the consultation they had time to do everything um, there's even a survey that was done uh, in in the peak article that was mentioned saying that 77 percent of the athlete thinks that the name should be changed. And I think that the impact here over ma matter over the intention. So whether the intention was to keep the Scottish heritage or SFU, that doesn't matter. Like the, what matters is the impact it's having on student athletes and like how that impacts them. So just want to emphasize on that point. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, so on the topic of the joint operations update, is there any other questions on that? All right. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, I was very confused. Okay, so we'll move. We'll move on then from six point one and. We'll move into six point, actually, uh, we'll move into 6.2 with a working group on the SFSS Student Town Hall, uh, which is technically Belkis, but she is not here because she's actually doing a test run right now um, in preparation for the town hall that is happening uh, next week. So, um, yeah, I, I, I actually am not prepared to give an update, but I, I suppose I'll just say that the town hall is happening on july what's the date i'm pulling up my calendar here july the 7th from 4 30 to 6 30 and it'll be uh via zoom and uh you know there'll be it, it's kind of a hybrid where students can submit questions ahead of time uh but um there will be an opportunity for students to ask live questions and it'll be a sort of panel type event so looking very much forward to that and um you know i'm wishing uh Balkis and her team right now good luck in their test run and very excited to see that um so moving on further we'll go to 6.3 uh sama do you have any updates on your uh, working group on emergency response and student engagement yes uh, thank you mr chair so i have a few updates uh, now we have confirmed date for full hub uh, that is 22nd of july two special days uh, 
my birthday as well. So just putting it out there again. And uh, uh, yes, uh, there's a few concerns as well that I want to share with you guys. So the first concern is there, there will be some um, you know, perishable produce, uh, which is why they are going to bring in their own fridge for that to store it. Uh, I'm having a meeting with them on Friday so to discuss it further. For right now, my understanding is they're going to bring it, produce, store it for the time being, and then take it away because that was that was our last conversation. So they're not going to store it overnight, but they're going to bring in fridge to put in per perishable produce to tell the student pick up. And they're going to have their own fridge there. But uh, since our emergency response uh, program will end in October, and uh, their part will end as well, uh, and uh, Matt, our stu uh, VP of Student Services, have indicated that he would like to continue the program as a long-term strategy. If uh, this pilot program is successful, then they, on that basis, they are thinking of uh, leaving the fridge behind in form chamber. Since they don't want it, they, they want us to have it afterwards. Uh, if you're going to keep the program continuing, it would be nice to have a fridge. That's what they're indicating. So, so I, I want to know if everyone is like, uh, what their thoughts are on this. Do they want to leave the fridge behind? Uh, is everyone okay with this? Well, is everyone okay with them bringing the fridge on campus? This is their own fridge. It's like, I don't really mind to be honest. And second thing is, uh, uh, who is going to do the yeah, promo work? Uh, Tara is asking if uh, uh, SFE should build up a posters and everything because she has a communication people on her side as well who are working on making a poster for Food Hub and everything. So she is asking to give a, give them a quick reply on like if SFSS wants to take over poster services and they want to make the poster and post it or should they make the poster and send it to us and we share it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we need to start working on building our uh, application form on our website. So I can work on questions uh, that needed to go on uh, on on the application and I can share with you. And then if everyone is okay, then I would like to put this request in to make a application form go up and everything so we can do a little bit of test run as well and make sure that everything is running smoothly. And then when all the parties are okay with it, we can start promotion. So this is the update for now. So I'll take in any question anyone might have. And okay. Um, yeah, I think it would be cool if uh, they make the, po like Tara makes the poster and sends it into us, like the second option you said. Um, and yeah, I like, I support Matt in him wanting to continue this program on. And what about the fridge, Anuki? Do you want the fridge? <laughs> um. Can you expand on that point? I didn't really understand that. So yeah, gonna... just some. I just want to ask before you go. Um, it, like personally, I I don't see a problem with having them bring in a fridge and for it staying on our premises for the duration of this program. And if it were to extend beyond the date we've currently set for the program to end, I'm I'm fine with that. I just want to know, like, what what measures are being put in place in terms of making sure that any perishables are, are taken care of and, um, you know, food isn't going to waste or rotting in our spaces. <laughs> so uh, that's the thing. So uh, the program is supposed to just uh, like bring in the food that is needed to dispatch. Like students are going to fill out the survey in advance, uh, put their applications down that they want the service and they're going to come and pick it up. So we're only going to prepare food for that quantity. And so to so that will ensure that there will be limited waste, to be honest. And then a food that is all food that is like leftover after like no one picked up maybe, right? And then those that leftover food will be taken by them. So that's what I talked about. Like we don't want to leave any food behind. Even though if they, they want to bring in the food and everything, they are the one who's going to dispatch food and take care of everything. This all, everything is going to be taken care of from the outside. We are just going to help them set up things and like help them uh, do a little bit of volunteering work and we are providing them space where they can operate. So even though they want to have fridge on our premises and store perishable food, I'm hoping last time I talked, uh, they're going to take it away with them afterwards.
All right, Samad. Um, Wei Chen, you have a question? Uh, yeah, like I don't see a problem with keeping the fridge. Um, like if Matt intends to continue um, the food hub after it ends in October, like then we will probably need, it would be good to have that fridge um, wherever we choose in the future to locate the food hub. It could be in our, uh, I think I talked to someone a little bit about this, it could be, we could find a space in our new sub building to make it like a food hub um, kind of place because that is kind of a one of, um, Matt's platform, which is like to establish a food hub for students. So yeah, I don't see any problems keeping the fridge and like continuing the the program. Like hopefully continuing the program. Anuki. Um. Yeah, I think like there should be uh a lot of like measures taken place to prevent food waste, um, because that's like a big issue. Uh in general. And um, so then, yeah, I would support having the fridge as well. Yeah, um, apologies if this was already, um, you already addressed this, Samad, but is there um, something in place to ensure someone has food safe? Uh, okay, so, I. Uh, uh, my understanding was that uh, Simone, who is the person at uh, who who is basically in charge of Food Hub, is the person who has this uh, food safe certificate, and they are the one who's going to dispatch and everything. But uh, to confirm it uh, for hundred percent sure, I'm meeting them uh, on Friday. I can confirm it uh, at that time as well. I can I can just make made a note right now. Would that do? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, let us know because I think that's pretty important. Wonderful. Uh, Wei Chen? Um, uh, is it, uh, who was, what is, what's the name of the company that's uh, working with uh, Tara for providing the food, I guess? It would be good to know. Uh, it's United Foods, I believe. It's United. Yeah, it's, no, it's United. I can check the, uh proposal again is everything is in there i have shared it with everybody as well but like uh, i'll just pull it up and confirm it uh after the meeting i believe uh if anyone else wants to know as well i can just uh, message you privately but like i just don't want to say the name wrong and then you know create confusion all right uh anuki um i have a question so um is it like pre-made food or is it like groceries? Um, Cause like, I'm just thinking, are there like vegan, vegetarian, halal, different options? Because if it's like pre-made, uh, you might have to consider that. But if it's like just groceries then people can make it themselves, obviously, right? So, uh, so it's, it's not gonna be pre-made. They are not gonna cook anything and dispatch it that way is mostly going to be produced itself they're gonna like students can just pick up it's a grocery style as i would say uh, if, uh I, but like uh, i can get more details on like what kind of food there will be or what kind of items there will be uh, on friday as well but uh, uh, they don't know it for themselves as well because like they collect uh, rescue foods as well and then they create packages so a student can like indicate what they're allergic with uh, or if they have any kind of allergies and they want to remove some item but the package will happen like uh, they will know only one week in advance in some way all right thank you samad um are there any concluding comments or questions I think uh, Samad Sarah mentioned maybe connecting with Lawrence because he was here when there is a, a physical food bank. He might have some good pointers. So that's something to remember. And uh, I'm seeing no more discussion. So uh, we move on then from Samad's update. Thank you. Um, on to actually, I'll stay on you, Samad, if you have any updates from the COVID 19 coalition. 
Uh, no, a lot, after last time we have not met uh, COVID-19 creation is also like a lot of, of that members are working on town hall meetings as well, such as wins uh, and then uh, so uh, we do not have any kind of hard update for you guys at the moment. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. I just thought I'd check in and um, this is kind of just a standing update item. So if there's no updates, that's cool. Um, and we'll continue to hear any updates as they come in. So we can move from 6.4 then to uh, 6.5, which is uh, anti-Black racism. And I'll pass it over to Nafoni or Anuki. Um, yeah, hold on. Just give me one second. Um, I'm just pulling up our notes. And also, if I miss anything, like please, Nafoni, uh, fill me in. Like, fill whatever I say in. Um, so basically, hold on. Um, we met, we had a, uh, meeting with, um, like last week, um, at, with Nifoni, um, uh, me, Wei Chin, um, I think Gabe, you were there and Jasmine Peachy. Um, and sorry, I'm just trying to find, the, um, Oh no, I can't find the, the... I have it open if you want me to speak. Yeah, sure, please. <laughs> okay, cool. So yeah, as Anuki said, we met last week with Jasmine, who's on the call with us today, Gabe, also Emily, Wei Chin. Um, I think that was everyone in the meeting. And we discussed a few things and the action items that we have um, decided upon after the meeting. So we are creating as the motion we talked about before, um, a working group to tackle this issue, an anti, anti-racism anti working group. Uh, me and Anuki will be like spearheading that working group and Jasmine has agreed to be working in it as well, which is amazing. Um, so next steps for us, we are looking to create a petition to be circulated to all undergrads at SFU. Um, the petition will be in regards to um, creating curriculum at SFU for all the departments for anti-racism, um, mandatory anti-racism classes. And we will also be circulating a letter to deans of each faculties, which will probably be working with the farm reps to do that. Um, so that's the, the next steps for us. We have yet to create the petition or the letter, but um, once we do that, I will come back to you and give um, the information for that. Yeah, and we is there anything wanna, else? Uh, yeah, we want to create like the social media campaign. So I think we'll definitely be putting in work orders um, to create like the um, graphics and everything. And we would love for like we would ask obviously for the board to share it. And um, I think we would be doing the we would be like putting the petition within the social media campaign and. Um, I guess like the letter as well. Um, but yeah, that's all I think that we have. Yeah. And if there's anything else, Jasmine, feel free to add, but that's all from us. Awesome. Thank you, Nafoni and Anuki. Um, are there any questions about that? No. Okay. I think we're also going to. We have a motion to establish that working group coming up next. So if it's safe, I'm going to move on from this update item into new business then. If there's no more discussion. I'll just give it three seconds. All right, cool. We'll move it to uh, new business then. Our first motion, well, our first and only motion, working group on anti-Black racism. Let me find the wording again. All right, so be it resolved that the UAA committee establish a working group on anti-Black racism. Be it further resolved to appoint Jasmine Peachy as members of this working group uh, with Nafoni and Anuki as working group leads. Um, does somebody want to move the motion? Oh, dang. Okay, Samad, does somebody want to second the motion? I'll second. Nafoni, thank you. Um, and any discussion on the motion? 
I think we kind of already went over it, unless you wanted to add anything else, Nafoni or Nuki. Um, yeah, so this is th this will be like under UAA, but um, is it possible to like um, create it c like co under uh, BIPOC committee or does that make sense? Like having it under yeah, or would we just I, have to like work with them? That's a, that's it's a good point that you bring that up because I was actually I was just about to move to amend the motion to include language around working with the BIPOC committee. So I'll actually go ahead and do that. Um, so I would like to move to amend the motion uh, to add uh, for the first line to read: uh, "Be it resolved that the UAA committee." establish a working group on anti-black racism to work alongside and with direction from the black indigenous people of color committee um so would someone like to second that amendment i can second it Anuki. okay cool um and is there any discussion on that amendment does it kind of solidify what you were just trying to yeah yeah exactly that's uh, perfect okay awesome so I'm just gonna, um, I'll type that out. All right, cool. So um, I guess based on the discussion, I'll uh, seek unanimous consent on this amendment. So all those in favor of the amendment. All right, um, seeing none, that amendment will carry unanimously. And so we'll move back to the main motion then. Uh, be it resolved that the UA, or is there any discussion on the main motion before we move to a vote? No, okay, so I'll just read out, read it out again. Uh, be it resolved that the UAA committee established a working group on anti-Black racism to work alongside and with direction from the Black Indigenous People of Color Committee. Be it further resolved to appoint Jasmine Peachy as members of this working group with Nafoni Anunuki as working group leads. Um, again, I'll seek unanimous consent on the motion. All those in favor, and if um, if anyone uh, is opposed or would like to dissent, abstain. Just please unmute your mic. I'm not expecting any, but um, so I'm seeing no opposition. So that motion will also carry um, is carried as amended unanimously. Amazing, wonderful. Um, Okay, cool. So we'll move on from new business then to our discussion items. And Jasmine, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if you like. Um, you are welcome to leave if you have other things to do, but we absolutely all of it when people stay for a meeting. So you're totally free to do whatever you want. <laughs> um, so we'll move into our discussion items then. Um, our first one is COVID-19 uh, infographics. And just as an uh, overall update, uh, I think I've spoken about it at this committee, but um, I uh, took on a project to take uh, some of the quantitative data that we received from our SFSS COVID-19 survey that was conducted um, toward the end of the spring semester and taken that quantitative data and uh, worked with Sindhu and she's really helped me create some pretty good uh, infographics based on those COVID, uh, that quantitative data. and. We're trying to use that information um, via our social media platforms on Facebook and social media to, to try and draw attention to our demands and why they are so important. You know, why is there such a high number of students who don't have adequate Wi-Fi? Why are, is there such a large percentage of students who don't feel comfortable with some of the requests that, our prof that their professors or instructors have made? We're gonna continue to use this information online to emphasize why it's important to do things such as implement asynchronous learning, why we need uh, further uh, uh, emergency funding for students in need, why um, you know we need, uh, I don't know, I'm blanking out, but <laughs> but why we need all those things that, that we're um, 
that we're requesting at the university. And so I'll just ask if there's, um, I'll make sure to email all of those to all the infographics to you, but they're slowly going to come out on social media, um, on our social media pages. So um, if there's any questions regarding that, um, I'm not expecting much, but it's just kind of an update for me. If not, we'll move on then um, to our next discussion item, which is 7.2 or 8.2 at this point. Um, more problems with exam invigilation. Um, so <laughs> we have some more issues regarding exam invigilation. Now, I, I think um, most of us know that um, at the beginning of the semester, it was kind of made pretty clear that if professors and instructors were planning on using exam invigilating software, any third party software, anything at all that required students to be uh, recorded or using live, um, you know, you had to be on, on this program at a specific time for your exam and you will be watched by your professor or TA or somebody, that that needed to be made very apparent to students um, before the withdrawal deadline. So students had an opportunity to actually withdraw from that course if they didn't feel comfortable with what the professor was asking them. Um, and for the most part, that was done. Um, some There were, were some instances where professors weren't actually abiding by that. And luckily those were caught. They were either brought to us or the ombudsperson. And in those cases, the professor was able to reverse that decision. However, we have a, a bigger issue that's come up because uh, when these concerns around exam vigilation were first brought up, I, th uh, I my understanding is that the university took those concerns to mean, uh, you know, we're not convinced that this is legal. Um, are students, are you allowed to record students without their consent? Is this an invasion of privacy? There were a lot of questions around that. And for that reason, um, there was a lot of limitations put on what exam vigilating software could actually be used. Um, however, uh, some recent uh, decision made by, I, I believe it was the SFU privacy officer, I'm not actually 100% um, sure of the, of the title of the, of the role, but um, has basically uh, concluded that professors are allowed to use uh, certain programs um, to invigilate exams as long as students are not being recorded. And this is uh, quite alarming because students were under the assumption, you know, for a long time that, well, first of all, students are finding out very suddenly that professors are actually making requests. It's now like what, week eight, and professors are now very suddenly making requests of students saying, oh yeah, by the way, you need to download this for your exam, this spyware software or this, this, this uh, exam proctoring. Uh, material so that um, you can be evaluated for your final examinations. And this is contrary to what students thought, you know, were the policies implemented that you need, you were supposed to be made aware of this before the withdrawal deadline. And so uh, the, we did bring uh, uh, myself and also we brought this concerns uh, right to John Driver, the vice uh, president uh, academic uh, of SFU and provost. And our, you know, our concerns were pretty, pretty clear and nothing out of the ordinary, you know, we were deeply concerned upon learning that fact. And considering that at the beginning of the semester, students were kind of put into a, you know, false sense of security that, you know, you told us this, and now you're kind of going back on your word. Um, and it, it just really appears to directly contradict what you said at the beginning of the semester. And obviously right now, it would be an injustice, to the st an injustice, pardon me, to the students who decided to stay enrolled in courses under the assumption that they wouldn't have to use this, this software. And an alarmingly high number of students have been contacting the SFSS saying they're not comfortable or they are very, dissatisfied with the fact that all of a sudden this is coming out. And so that was brought forward to John Driver in an email. I, I emailed him last week. And the, the response was not very great. Um, he continues to emphasize that 
these decisions are best placed in the hands of instructors and that it's not really the place of the university to come in and give a overall centralized mandate on what they should, what they should, can and cannot do in terms of exam vigilation. Um, you know, they, they, he claims that they're still committed to reducing academic dishonesty and cheating in all forms. Um, and that, you know, programs such as Proctorio, Examity, or ProctorU aren't being piloted in the summer, but will be piloted in the fall. Which also kind of, to me, alludes to the fact that spring might be online too, considering they're piloting it in the fall. But nonetheless, um, you, you know, technologies such as Zoom or BB Collaborate or other things um, that allow professors to watch their students um, during an exam is being allowed by the university as long as it's not being recorded. And the, the argument still stands for them that how is this any different from watching, you know, if you're sitting in a lecture hall in person, how is it any different than your TA or professor or someone walking around a lecture hall and watching you? Well, there's actually many arguments against that. First of all, it's a huge invasion of privacy. Students don't often actually have a space like myself where I can close the door and be alone. Some professors ask that, you know, their family not use the Wi-Fi while they're doing an exam, which is absolutely like everyone else is working from home too. It's not just students. So that's not a viable request. And many other issues that students are facing right now in terms of trying to do exams um, using the software. And of course, the very alarming response that I got from him toward the end of the email is, and, I, and I'm quoting this now, he says, I note that the SFSS has been contacting instructors about their use of Zoom. Instructors are not obliged to respond to generalized concerns expressed by the SFSS. Um, so basically he's telling me that if a student comes to you with a concern and you go and contact the professor, they actually have no obligation to respond to you. Which I, I really take is is dumb because our, our job here as a student society is to make sure that students students needs are being students concerns and needs are being brought to the university and if you know he's undermining that that is very deeply concerning but um i will continue to bring our concerns forward and i'm yet to respond to that email but i'm about to i'm about to do that this evening hopefully um, and I, I will continue uh, myself. I want to work with senators and then myself, I'm a senator. So I, I'm going to continue to bring questions about exam and vigilation to the Senate because I think that there are still many questions to be answered and many demands that need to be addressed. Um, and so with that, I just want to open up the floor to d discussion on anything that I just mentioned or thoughts on exam and vigilation. I, I've seen a lot of stuff happening in the chat. I'm not sure if anyone listed. Yeah, I did yeah. this before. That. Oh, wait, sure. Wait, Chen and then Um, Yeah, like, this is just, I don't know, it was really disappointing. Like, not disappointing, like, I expected this. It's just really crazy that, like, the VP and, the, like, the VPs are so, you know, like, they really think that this is not a big deal. And this is just how things are right now. And this is how it's going to be. And that's totally not true. Um, yeah, like Gabe just forwarded an email to all the board members um, with John Jarvis' response, and it was really something. Um, I think like, I think we're way past the point of going to admins, going to Senate, and like pushing for um, stuff like this. This is just we need to escalate into actions right now because they're obviously not listening to us. Um, you know, um, they're saying that they're suspending like pilot on projects, not pilot projects, but a like pilot proctoring software on, on for summer, but they might go into the fall. So like they did get some examples. Um, I heard, heard of some of this before. Uh, let me just find the names of the proctoring software. So Proct uh, Proctor IO, Examity, and Proctor U, uh, which is like dimension three of these. And Proctor IO actually had a really big, um, 
exposed, like they got exposed, like one of their CEO was found to like be leaking like information um, from on UBC students. So I'll, I'll link the, the Twitter uh, thread about it. But yeah, this was a case in UBC. So these third party proctoring software is really not good and it's really just a huge invasion on, on privacy. Like it, it, rec it records your space, like has someone looking at you when you're doing the exam, it's just like all types of like creepy and it's just wrong. It's just really, really wrong. Like the fact that the university is not like outright banning like third party parking software is just ridiculous. And like in it, like notably in the email, he also mentions that um, he thinks that like even like Zoom proctoring, like webcam um, invigilation is like the same thing as an in person exam when that is totally not true. Like in an in, in, in an in-person exam, like there's like TAs and there's professors, but they're constantly walking around the room, like scanning around the room. They're not hovering over you. They're not constantly staring at you. But for a webcam invigilation, like you literally have the webcam right in front of you. They're constantly looking at your keyboard, what you're typing, where, you, where you're looking, if you have any like suspicious movement or whatever, like it's just not the same. And like, I don't understand why like John Jarvis doesn't see it's not the same. And we really need to hit, like, you know, just say that this is really putting a lot of unnecessary stress on students. And you're, you're like, you're not creating a good uh, learning environment for students. Um, you're ruining, like, the relationship between profes professors and students and putting a responsibility on students to be the one, like, emailing prof and emailing chairs and ombudsperson and going through all this process that's so stressful when you can just, you know, make a mandate and, like, set some guidelines on this kind of stuff. So... Uh, I just think we're way past like talking to them. That's just what I'm saying. Thank you for your thoughts, Wei Chen. Anuki? Yeah, um, I think it's like incredibly inappropriate and unreasonable for profs to be asking these things of students, especially like when you said they're asking the family to stop using the Wi-Fi. Like other people have jobs and things to do too. Like how can how can you ask that of like family members and do that and also um yeah like that it's it's just like kind of scary to me that it just feels like we're living in a surveillance state or something when they're putting they're making students download this spyware and um yeah and then there's even like issues with zoom too like how it's not encrypted and everything but that's like another thing yeah i don't understand how it's not like already illegal um and I know like UBC, my friends from UBC, they've had to download this stuff too. And it's just so creepy. Yeah, I don't understand how it's not illegal and like how have like, like have they even been, like, have people considered even suing? Like, I don't even know like what, why this is even a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anuki. Um, Samad is next on the list. Yeah, so I know like everybody is so concerned about this and this is kind of horrifying to know that they want to run a pilot program and fall like uh, having conversation with John Driver again and again about this proctoring software, about uh, uh, like uh, education quality going down because it has moved online and all the argument he gives out is like, it's same as just moved online. It's same as just moved online. Uh, this is putting too much stress on students. Like at the end, it just feels like, oh, whole pandemic is a student's fault. Like lost their jobs and now they have to pay like heavy tuition fees, go through the proc proctoring, who have online, like, come on. Does he even know that not everybody has good a Wi-Fi? Does he even know that like people have trouble? Like if someone is in some other country and they have they don't have sufficient wi-fi or good internet service like what they're going to do with it like if their wi-fi stops working in the middle are they going to charge get charged with cheating because like oh they went off camera like they have to consider so many things this is like putting too much like right now i'm just thinking oh in fall semester that's going to be my last semester hopefully and i'm going to be downloading some proctoring software i don't even download it like a usual thing, like stupid games from internet because I'm too afraid that that might hack my computer, like literally. And every week I run like a spyware 
software on my computer just to see if there is some kind of malware. Like I'm that kind of person. Like what's going to happen with me if I start downloading a proxy software and that has control over my computer? Just thinking about me gives me stress. Like this is ridiculous. And I think like in the Senate, we have to just push for it. Now this is, this is I, I think it's just too much. It's, we have to stop talking to John Driver about like, okay, yeah, giving explanation because all the argument he gives out is like, it's same, it's just moved online. It's same, it's just moved online. Like, I don't even know if he knows what online means. Thank you, Samad. Um, Amrily? Yeah, I was gonna agree that the software creates um, added stress on top of the exam already and profs should be aware of the student's well-being and I know a lot of faculties preach like student support and all that so it's kind of unfair to say that the SFSS can't advocate on behalf of the students and I think I don't know like within our own faculties I'm sure the farm reps could speak to our deans about it um, to get to the bottom of it I know that within the faculty of education I'm not sure if the structure is the same for all faculties but there's an undergraduate programs committee where students can bring forward any recommendations or issues on behalf of students so I think that's like one avenue other than um, senate that we can pursue as well yeah that's a very good idea I think we should look into it I think education might be a bit unique in terms of um those kind of channels and structures, but I'd love to see if there's something similar in other faculties. Um, so yeah, I in terms of the SFSS's role in advocating for these concerns, I take actually great offense to that one line that he um, mentioned in his email, and I, I will be addressing that quite head on. But in, in regards to exam vigilation, um, we're getting to the point where it's, becoming a bit, it is becoming repetitive and we're kind of just talking to a brick wall at this point. So uh, we're gonna have to figure out ways to escalate and I would like to at least try um, and bring some of these concerns to Senate and hopefully get some of these demands figured out for the fall semester, but we're gonna have to figure out um, figure out ways to escalate because it's getting it's getting a bit much and so yeah is there um any other comments on the topic of exam vigilation yeah wei chen yeah like i, I think we need to um uh, kind of brainstorm on like how to escalate this um like yeah like do still go to senate and still do like do still bring this up but like, from the sfss side like how what can we do? Like, how can we tell um, our students that we've done all we can um, in terms of like, you know, talking to John Jarver in terms of um, bringing to Senate. This is not new to the Senate as well. Like, what can like we need to let students know that, and we need to know that okay, we need to step up our actions. We need to, um, you know, either you know a petition or uh, just like, you know just some sort of action to escalate because emailing and all that is just not there's no point like you said we're like at this point talking to a brick wall so this something has to be done before the fall semester starts to set the tone um otherwise it's just going to go into the fall and this is to keep happening and happening uh so i would like to hear if anyone has any ideas on that um uh anuki you're next on the list yeah um I was just wondering, are there any like petition petitions or like social media campaigns going around about this? And maybe, oh, I see Rachel shaking his head. Um, if like, since there isn't, maybe we can create that and maybe like um, have like something stronger through that. Yeah, I think that's definitely an avenue we can go down. Yeah, and I think that also comes down to a broader discussion to um, not just exam vigilation, but there are a lot of other topics that really need garnered support from the students, such as um, asynchronous learning, which I guess does 
an exam invigilation does kind of fall under the umbrella of asynchronous learning as well. And um, trying to get a petition out for, for that sort of thing, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just wondering if we can just kind of think like, cause since it's that kind of very, uh, like we've been posting like the graphic and stuff on like the survey and um, I think we should really incorporate that as well, like incorporate the invigilation into that campaign. So um, either starting, like, I don't know, like, I, I don't know if petition is like the best way or it's the right step to escalate for to, um, yeah, but it should be like the demands of like, okay, letting our students know we've done this, we've done that, nothing's happening. So now it's time to like, you know, really get together, mobilize, um, we need like unless if you know okay we have this demands we have like you know we think education is not the same we think tuition should be lower we think um third party proctoring should not be a thing and where kind of education should also like not be a thing and like just have all this like list of demands and really like be firm on that um yeah anuki yeah um yeah i agree but maybe we can also like take it to the media as well if it's not already on the media um yeah mm -hmm. definitely i don't know if this is something that's even like been brought up or been appeared in like issues of the peak uh, i'm not sure if like exam vigilation has been brought up but yeah even um you know other media as well not just the peak but yeah even like ctv exactly Yeah, so we can continue to, um, I think, have those brainstorming discussions around how we can escalate this. And maybe we can even bring this to uh, a future meeting because I think this is a, something we really need to discuss. And Poom, can go, you can go ahead. Uh, as a last resort, um, I'm not an expert on law in any way, but I'm pretty sure forcing students to install spyware otherwise they would fail the class is illegal so like actually threatening them last resort What's yeah last well i'm not entirely sure because they're uh, I, i'm fairly certain the university wouldn't do anything that's illegal and they probably know what they're doing within the bounds of the law so um we'd have to we'd have to check check on that because it, it does, again, come down to, I, I think when it is verging on the line of breaking the law is when you start recording students. Um, but, you know, when it comes to using certain software like Zoom or other typical video conferencing software, that technically is not illegal, no matter how uncomfortable you were making students by asking them to use that software, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something to to think about. And um, Proctorio, um, well, yeah, I, I, when it comes to things like Proctorio, again, I think it just comes down to, and I'm not, I've never actually encountered, had to use that program myself. I don't know if that involves recording students in any way, um, but definitely using third-party applications, again, just comes down to that really, make students uncomfortable, make students feel unsafe. Um, their data and their, you know, the personal information on their computer, you know, it, and situations like the ones that Wei-Chin just shared, the, the Twitter links, it's very blatantly clear that <laughs> these are not secure and not the best programs to be using um, for exams. So continuing to, uh, you know, ad address those concerns as well. Um, I, wait, Shin, are you on the list? Sorry, I, there, it's a bit of a mess in the chat. <laughs> so yeah, I'm on the list. I'm just saying like we should, like in terms of action, we should continue this discussion on Discord. But yeah, just to like, um, I guess, direct response to what Poom said. Yeah, I think, I don't know if there's anything illegal with like Zoom um, proctoring. Um, might have to look, look into that, but I don't think there's anything illegal with it. But um, yeah. Even like if it's not illegal, it's just the point of like adding stress on students and like why it's bad. 
Uh, I think Corbett showed me a, a article. I haven't read it yet, but I think he said there's some good information on it on like why online proctoring like that is like not good just for like mental health and everything like that. So we need to like really counter the point of like um, all their all their um, reason of like oh it's the same thing as in person when you get counter that it's not and like add on to like okay this add on stress the mental health of students and all this um, just countering that and like our potential like our petition whatever. Um, and like we brought to the what happened with UBC was that apparently the uh, like a student had a problem with or something with the proctoring um, when doing the exam, uh, and then disconnected or whatever. And then they were getting like a help, uh, like their their um, help, uh, what do you call it, live chat like help um, support, but it wasn't working or whatever, or the person was not responding um, on the proctor uh, tutorial side. And then like the students posted on social media. Um, uh, I'll post the like a screenshot of like the the chat on like social media saying oh like I, my portfolio is not working I seek help from their chat but it's like they didn't respond or whatever then I think the CEO got like kind of pissed off because someone like posted a bad review about his company right so and then he he posted like a screenshot of the chat or whatever of that student on like online and then that's how that whole thing started so it just it's just things like that and it's like uh, in terms of like data and like privacy stuff i think it, it just depends on like the third party provider like what they do with your data and like you have to consent to like you know uh to them having your data them having recording your your uh, doing the exam so yeah this is just a, it's just a whole mess and this should not uh, be done so yeah thank you wei chen um, so yeah, I think this is a discussion, as Weichin suggests, this is a discussion that we can continue to brainstorm on Discord or uh, offline and um, bring these suggestions back to UAA and hopefully have a, a more some more fruitful discussion on that. Um, so I'll move on then um, to a very similar topic, which is 7.3 on our discussion items, asynchronous learning. Um, and so as part of um, our de demands that were formed um, as a result of our COVID-19 survey, uh, one of those is we want SFU to implement asynchronous learning. And this is a huge focus that I, that we be focused on for the fall. And the, the, you know, when we're asking for asynchronous learning, we really need to be uh, careful and make sure that any types of learning methods that are implemented by the university are equitable for all students because not everyone is facing the same situation when it comes to their home lives or their home environment, um, how they learn best. Um, some students absolutely need a live setting where they are you know, forced to sit down at a specific time and digest what the professor is saying and type and be able to ask questions in that live setting. Some students don't, some students are really struggling with the home environment right now and they need to be able to work at their own pace and listen to lecture recordings and do other types of participation that don't require them to be on a video conferencing software for their class. And so that really comes down to making sure that any plans that the university or ourselves, plans that we are asking for, are equitable for students. So I think that's something that we, we've been advocating for asynchronous learning, but there, when it comes down to it, we really need to have a plan for what we're asking. And it, it, there needs to be a bare bones plan that instructors need to be mandated to follow by the university. And I think that should be approved by a certain hierarchy of, you know, maybe a plan for a course needs to be approved by a department chair before it actually, students actually receive that course. So I think some main things that really need to be emphasized here are that asynchronous learning, no live participa participation is mandatory. And uh, again, I think, <laughs> John Driver keeps mentioning how um, they're encouraging professors to use different um, untraditional methods of, uh, you know, final examinations that differ from the traditional exam, final exam format. 
And so there's many different ways to do this and that really should be implemented such as Canvas participation, more written activities, more offline participation, things that don't require um, students to, to you know, be at a desk and actually participate online at a specific time. And again, this comes down to uh, a second aspect of this, which is no online proctoring using Zoom video software or other proctoring software, a third party or not. And um, again, for, for alternatives to midterms or finals using other methods, more written assignments, open book exams, projects, even if they're group projects, things that are useful critical and you know satisfactory evaluations of a student's ability to learn the course concepts um and i just love to hear thoughts from the committee members on what you know when you say asynchronous learning what do you think that plan should look like and what at a bare bones level should professors be mandated to follow anuki yeah um something that comes to mind right off the bat is how um exams shouldn't really be timed um but if they are maybe give like longer time because like recently i just like yesterday i had an exam it was four hours and we had to do two essays and like one short answer and it was like way too it wasn't it was kind of unfair um a lot of people were saying it should have been 24 to 48 hours or even like a couple days and take home like maybe take home exams should be something that should be a, a thing or even like assignments and projects because even before COVID like a lot of my sociology classes or other classes had projects instead of exams so why can't they just continue that on like why do they still have to like keep doing like, exams right mm -hmm. um yeah and um I remember doing this survey from SFU it um they emailed it to me and they asked a question like um uh, and one of the options was like having a, being able to do schoolwork on your own time or own schedule. Um, so that could be like an option where if like students are working or have busy schedules, they can. Um, but I'm not sure what that entails exactly, but something along those lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to things like um, the working on your own schedule, um, students shouldn't be, it shouldn't be mandatory for students to attend a lecture at a certain time. I think that how it could work is, you know, a professor is still, I don't know, say your class is at 1230, you can still log on at 1230 and receive the lecture live. If that's your learning style. You're not required to be there, but you can be there if you would like. If you want to ask the professor questions live during that lecture, you can still you can still do so. But those lectures should be recorded. So then the students who choose to work at their own pace, more at their own pace, can go back, you know, can at their own time, anytime during that week and watch that recorded lecture, but not have to be there live when it happens. Um, that was an idea of, of mine. Um, yeah, uh, someone else was on the list. Emily, you can go ahead. Yeah, the only thing that makes that difficult is that a lot of instructors are looking to build community online. So synchronous lectures where students engage in discussions with the prof is like something that they want to do. And I know it's difficult for those who need asynchronous learning. And I know a lot of education courses in particular, they're like four hour blocks. So the profs normally don't talk for that long. Um, it's more like they'll talk for an hour at most and then there will be discussions and then the prof will also record like an offline lecture for students to listen to. So yeah, I, I understand, but it's just difficult. Thank you, Amrily. Um, I'll respond to them in a minute, but Anuki was on the list before me, so you can go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree. Like. Uh, like my prof he was saying how um it's kind of funny that we like a lot of it is just blank uh, or like um blank screens because people don't put their cameras on and there's like a loss of connection and community and that's something that I really miss from lectures and stuff like because I am like a bit of an extrovert and I love 
um, being around other people. And yeah, if like there's a way of overcoming that as well, um, that would be great. And yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there is kind of a, a fine balance there where you're, where you have to, of course, I totally understand like the need and the want to kind of build community online. Um, and there is a lot of merit to that. I think that the challenge comes down to, um, it, in my opinion, it seems to kind of be holding, kind of clinging on to a teaching style that doesn't really work in the online realm. I, 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 I per, like, I love having conversations in class and um, being able to one-on-one, -on -one, you know, face-to-face -face communicate with my prof, communicate with my classmates. But I think we've all experienced, um, you know, classes where you see blank screens and muted microphones and breakout rooms where no one wants to say anything. I think we've all experienced that. It's a bit too, too real for us right now. So when it comes down to trying to build community online, there are a lot of attempts right now to make that online learning style work. I don't think it's working for a lot of students right now, though. When it comes to specific classes, like um, Emerly, a lot of education classes are seminar-based, and many other courses within the university are seminar-based. I think there are certain courses that absolutely could not run asynchronously like there it's just like some question some courses are like period no absolutely not and i think that for courses like that absolutely continue to run synchronously and um but it's dependent on the course as well i think maybe what needs to happen is um is that there needs to be uh, like when i talk about bare bone requirements there needs to be certain uh mandates given to professors such as no live participation, no live lectures, recorded lectures, different forms of participation, um, no proctoring, but that plan should pr be approved by a designated person, maybe a department chair, maybe a dean, I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but for courses that require something else, that absolutely cannot run asynchronously, or maybe even courses that need to run in person in the fall, because I know some labs and research intensive courses are still running in person. Those courses probably would have an exemption from that bare bones plan, but still need to be approved by a certain person to make sure that they're not straying too far away from what's, you know, making sure that those plans aren't causing stress or burdening student burdening students to you know a great extent um, <clears throat> um who was on the list first wei chin or anuki oh wei chin was i mean sure you can go ahead uh yeah like i think that the whole thing with asynchronous teaching is not say that everything should be asynchronous i think it's like just putting it so that it's not mandatory for for um Say uh, synchronous. If courses um, that are needed to be synchronous, like um, some of the education courses, um, like Emily said, then sure, like by all means, like you know that should be you know allowed, and students should know that. Um, but just I think on the point of asynchronous, just like a lot of the courses really don't need to be, but professors are making it so. Um, yeah, I understand that you know professors want to build that relationship and all that with the students. It is like kind of disengaging to have like cameras off and like professors talking to like a blank. And like black screen, so it was understandable. But uh, you know, everyone's having difficulty with this transition. Everyone's still adapting and still learning. Um, and some people might not be comfortable with being on camera and all this. Um, and we need to um, just really focus on being inclusive and being more accessible, making classes more accessible to students, not putting stress on students. Um, just thinking, really thinking about the mental health of students, and just giving the options out there that if you can but if, if courses doesn't need to be async like doesn't need to be synchronous teaching then students shouldn't be forced to that shouldn't students shouldn't be losing um their uh, marks in class over that so that, that that's just my thoughts on it mm -hmm. yeah i think it comes down to 
when I think of asynchronous learning, I think of three very basic ideas, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And I think when it comes to inclusion, we need to make sure that students are feeling included, they are feeling a part of something, but not feeling stressed by that. When it comes to equitability or equity, making sure that all learning abilities are respected and that each individual course, whether it's seminar based or something that requires more hands on, or I guess, what would you call it virtually? But <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, video conference based, um, that those specific courses each receive the layout that they deserve. And in terms of accessibility, just making sure education is still accessible to all of our students, including those who don't necessarily have the proper technology to participate in online classes. Um, our international students who are having to wake up at 2 a.m. to attend their live lectures. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll pass it off to Emily. Emily, she's on the list. I thought Anuki was before me. Oh, was she? Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, just really quickly, like, um, I feel like regarding the community building thing, it would be cool if there could be some kind of optional socials or anything like that. And But I don't know if that's just my extrovert side trying to, like, um, connect with people. But, um, and I, I pro that probably wouldn't even be possible. But I think, like, the pandemic is really revealing a lot of vulnerabilities and structural problems within, like, um, classes and, like, the university system and everything. Um, like, it, the, something that came to my mind is, like, during our accessibility SDI workshop, um, um, the the speaker told us about how pe sometimes people with disabilities, they, they, I mean, like, there are people with disabilities that um, aren't able to, like, show up on time to lectures and stuff um, just because of, like, the, whatever they have, right? Um, I'm not, like quite educated on that but there's like so many um things that need to be taken into account um and maybe like this will be like a new age of like rebuilding all of these or restructuring all of these things in general and um yeah like um I hope yeah uh, I lost my train of thought um but if it comes back to me I'll I'll let you know thank you Anuki um Emily yeah, I think it's important for profs to be cognizant about each student's, um, I guess, circumstances. And some of them might not be immediately, like, what is that word? Immediately, like, oh my god, I'm totally blanking. I have no idea what the word is. <laughs> um, but... Um, just to be cognizant of like students, international students who are back at home or like students with disabilities that can't attend lecture at that time or have like um, circumstances throughout the day and stuff like that. Um, so that learning is like universally designed and students don't have to necessarily like say that they have a disability to receive the accommodations. But I just remembered something when Anuki was saying, um, about her online exam, the written part. I know that a lot of um, people within the Faculty of Education right now are looking into ways to mitigate academic dishonesty. And I think it'd be kind of hard for them to allow students to spend one or two days on an exam because they're worried that students may pay other students to do it. And like that thought never came to my mind, but like, I guess they're just trying to find ways to like, I don't know, protect students' integrity and stuff like that. Wei Chen? Um, yeah, I think like, you know, I think we need to like really acknowledge that our education, the way we, we think of education and the way we think of like how education should be, like could be outdated and like, you know, we should adapt and change and you know, update that. Um, and some prof are like, my, like a lot of profs might be resistant to it because just all oh, this is just how education education is. It's just how it is. Like, um, like with things like exam as well. Like, there's better way to assess um, a student's um, 
knowledge and like to test whether a student is 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 um, actually learning something from the course and there's like other ways to do it other than like the tra traditional tests and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of studies on this on like how it's like kind of an, an effective way to gauge students um, learning ab ability so like you know even just like being assessed like like accessibility is like kind of not very well um what do you call it like it's still something like quite new in education on like um pros being like cognizant of like our diverse uh, student needs on like you know not everyone is, is the same and like some people might need more accommodation and that's like no some might, might be not like a fault of their own so just something we need to like kind of push for and uh you know adapting out the way we see education the way we uh, provide education to to students. Thank you, Wei Chen. One hundred percent agreed. So I think, in terms of asynchronous learning, uh, we brainstormed a lot of great ideas, and in terms of trying to actually, you know advocate for this type of asynchronous learning. I think something that we should actually do is, um, or that I'd like to work on is actually draft up some sort of plan that would say, okay, we want asynchronous learning. This is what it would look like. And these are some of the options um, that could be pursued. And not only can we use this as a tool for, you know, um, for online advocacy, like showing students, okay, yeah, this is what asynchronous learning means, and this is why it's important, and this is what it could look like, but also bringing those plans forward to bodies like the Senate. I'm on the um, Senate Committee on Undergraduate Studies, where a big, um, uh, uh, this is something that th that committee handles, so I can bring that forward there. There's a lot of um, different ways that if we put together some sort of plan, around what this could look like. It, it could help us greatly in our um, in our advocacy efforts. So that's something I'm hoping to continue working on over the next at least week or two and hopefully um, you know work alongside members of the committee to get that going. Anuki. Yeah, would it be a good idea if like we reached out to like our classmates or like connect with students and ask them like what their um, opinions are and their needs and stuff and like bring it back to this committee or even on the Discord channel? Absolutely. Um, did I skip more people again? I'm sorry, Samad. Um, <laughs> in terms of, uh, it's never a bad idea to, con to go up there and get student feedback. Always, 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 when in doubt, ask for opinions, ask for suggestions, ask for feedback. Um, so yeah. And apologies, uh, Mr. Raza, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Mr. Chair, you forgot about me. Oh my God, it hurts. Uh, I just wanted to actually uh, agree with Devachin and Anuki here regarding the uh, examination and restructuring because like uh, everyone talks about how we all have moved on and uh, from and we went through mobile uh, revolution and now world is it's a different world but we are still like using the same measurement to measure uh, our student knowledge and how well they perform like uh, i i have been on co-op and given so many interviews none of them actually asked me told me you have 10 seconds to solve this question or you or else you're not gonna get a job like that never happens so it's like examination is not the only answer to measure people's knowledge so we have to start rethinking how we can actually measure it we cannot just move it online and be like hey this you have to use proctors softwares to comply with what we think is the best uh, way to measure your knowledge. But we have to start thinking about what is the actually best way to test the knowledge in this day and age. It's all about is in this day and age because we are not living in 90s, 90s anymore. Thank you, Samad. Uh, Anuki? Yeah, um, what Samad just said, um, uh, like made me remember I saw this thing about how um, somebody was explaining in this video about how like the current education system actually um, conditions us and socializes us uh, to be members in like a ca capitalistic society. So 
um, the systems that are like currently in place or previously in place is um, actually just conditioning us to like, I don't know how to like, for a lack of a better term, be robots in a way. And it's just like, it's not very like accepting of like diverse needs and stuff. And if I do come across that, um, what I saw again, I can like share it in the discord. But yeah, I like, I'm a hundred, I'm a believer in like restructuring and like um, equitable and accessible ways of learning. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I'd love to read that actually. And I, I totally um, understand and sympathize 100% with um, paying attention to diverse needs. And that's absolutely something that doesn't unfortunately commonly get addressed at university in post-secondary institutions. So absolutely. So I am going to draw this discussion item to a close, I think. Sounds good. So we'll move forward then. Oh, and I, I sorry, we'll not, I'll not move forward because I just want to say I'm going to start drafting up some kind of some kind of plan and integrating the discussion that we had today, and maybe even Anuki, um, as Anuki suggested, maybe speaking with some students and gathering their thoughts, and we can kind of integrate that into um, some sort of plan as well, and move from there. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'd love to talk about this once the meeting's adjourned because I have so many thoughts on the education system, but we'll move on though. Anyway, um, so announcements. Um, the next UAA meeting is on Tuesday, July 14th um, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., same time as usual, two weeks today. Um, again, uh, you know, just to, to reiterate, Jasmine, again, these meetings are open to all students, so you're welcome to come if you want. And for, you know, the knowledge of our committee members, again, you can invite your friends and um, have them attend too. We love to hear um, our students' thoughts and love to see participation projects. So thank you for coming as well. I, I want to, I just want to say thank you and, and uh, very much happy to see your contribution to um, the anti-Black racism initiatives that are happening through this committee. Yeah. So we'll move on to adjournment then. So be it resolved to adjourn uh, this meeting at four, what time is it? 4.36 PM. Is someone able to move that motion? <laughs> Samad moves. He's excited to get out of here. Does someone want a second? A I'll second. Which in seconds, thank you. Um, so seeking unanimous consent, uh, all those in favor of adjourning. And seeing no opposition, that motion will carry unanimously. So thank you everyone for coming out and I hope you're having a good week so far and it continues to go smoothly and talk to you all soon.